In today's news, 13 new cases of COVID-19 confirmed in the British Virgin Islands. We see three of them being symptomatic cases. Of course, two of those um, uh, cases are employees of the One Mart Superstore and they tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, the agency continues to appeal for persons to be vaccinated. As well, the first cruise ship to set sail into the BVI that is going to be happening on July 1st and former police commissioner is now refuting claims by the House of Assembly Speaker, Mr. Julian Willock, of course, of him hiring regional criminals. And that is, of course, according to the Speaker of the House. We have all the details and so much more on today's edition of 284 News. The wait is over. CCT Fire is here. Experience ultra-fast downloads, seamless streaming, and even more reliable connectivity on an all-new fire-blazing, super-fast CCT Fire Network. CCT Fire. Bring it home and upgrade today. The wind up. What is the house? I'm freaking it. He is about to speak. It's always a pleasure coming to you live and direct from the... What's poppin'? What's really cool? Davis has won it for the Lakers! A warm BVI welcome to one and all of our viewers, of course, here in the beautiful British Virgin Islands and beyond. It is Tuesday, Tuesday 29th. 2021. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Ron Grant. We have lots in store for you, of course. In addition to what we mentioned earlier, we are joined by Dr. June Samuel, the culmination of Alzheimer's Awareness, of course, that includes Dementia Awareness uh, Month. We're uh, discussing the uh, triggers, what, what we can do to prevent, and a lot of the habits, really, that um, we would do it culturally, uh, Jovan, as, as residents, that may attribute to that. But of course, we're going to begin, of course, with the uh, beginning on the headlines in an official press release from One Mart Superstore. Yesterday, June 28, 2021, the agency notified the general public of COVID-19 uh, that was depicted in two of its employees. It stated, the management of One Mart Superstore and Food Service Division wishes to inform the public that two of our staff have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Our prayers go out to them to a safe and speedy recovery. In the interest, of course, of the safety of all staff and customers, we have asked all unvaccinated workers to quarantine at home until further notice. In addition to that, the agency said we are pleased that 75% 70 of our 140 workers are fully vaccinated and will continue to serve our customers. Now, in addition to that, the agency said, and I quote, we encourage all other staff to get vaccinated ASAP for their own safety. We appreciate that persons have medical and other reasons for not vaccinated. We continue to follow all COVID-19 requirements and, of course, recommended by the government. However, we lend our voice to encouraging all in the BVI to get vaccinated ASAP if you can. Now, of course, viewers, the total number of active cases in the territory now stands at 13 with 313 cases recorded uh, to date and 299 recoveries and one debt. Of course, we're going to get into the details of that, uh, of a recent press conference by our Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development. Beginning on our local scene, the British Virgin Islands is set to welcome its first passenger cruise ship since the advent of COVID-19 on July 1st. This was confirmed by the BVI Ports Authority in the media release on Friday, June 25th, which said Celebrity Millennial will be the ship to uh, berth the territory shores uh, from St. Martin. According to the release, the ship will be calling at the cruise pier at the uh, Cyril B. Romney Totola Pier Park and will also be making stops in Barbados and St. Lucia. In an official comment, the BVI Ports Authority said, and I quote, the BVI PA and the Cyril B. Romney Totola Pier Park teams have been working diligently with the Ministry of Health and Social Development BVI Tourist Board, local cruise agencies, and of course the cruise lines to ensure a healthy return to cruising. In addition, all passengers and said crew members are to be fully vaccinated. That's the uh, uh, cruise ship receiving. The BVI Ports Authority also outlined the protocols that will be followed by the cruise vessel, which will uh, consist of all vaccinated persons. In an official comment, they said celebrity millennial pre-boarding requirements call for guests over 16 years 
uh, of age to be fully vaccinated along with vaccination of coup. Additionally, testing, pre-screening, and embarkation measures are in place along with other onboard mitigation measures to ensure, of course, the health and safety of communities to the ships and its uh, passengers, as well as its guests and crew. Now, it added, while on land, cruise travelers must be in accordance with the existing BVI public health protocols. These include the wearing of face masks uh, by guests, the crew in public and communal settings, physical distancing of six feet must be observed during both embarkation and disembarkation uh, for on-island and uh, sea-based excursions, and hand-washing, of course, sanitization must be easily visible during uh, disembarkation. Now, BVI Ports Authority Managing Director Mrs. Ovaline Maynard encouraged residents to do their part in ensuring that cruising uh, returns successfully, of course, in the BVI. She said, and I quote, for a healthy return to cruise, we as a territory must be prepared and do our part to keep both our residents and visitors safe. Cruise tourism is part of our economy and the people of the British Virgin Islands play an important role in the resumption of this industry. Now, the BVI Ports Authority, um, as well as the BVI residents, was expected to receive the first passenger uh, cruise ship initially in June. However, the cruise was canceled after a number of positive COVID-19 cases were detected. Uh, Jovan, we are happy to finally see our first cruise line coming to uh, the BVI shores, but we have a number of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the case where we saw in the first instance where uh, the cruise ship was not uh, coming to the territory because many of the vaccinated persons uh, were tested positive. Who's to tell that this may not happen again? And right. in the second uh, instance, and most important, we are yet to understand uh, what the bubble, uh, which the government of the Virgin Islands have been speaking about so uh, feverishly, what, is, what does that look like? Uh, who does it involve? And uh, what are the areas of, con uh, uh, areas of contact? And I think that's important. We're excited, but we still have some questions. And lots of questions to especially uh, some of the tenants there at the Tortola Pier Park uh, who really needs to be uh, into, integrated into that process. Uh, Ron, we've speak, been speaking about the system yes. and about the fact that it works, but I think this will be the ultimate test uh, to see how ready we are to really welcome tourists back into the territory on a large scale. And again, it really boils back down to uh, the people of the territory and our willingness to do what is right uh, in following all the protocols that are mandatory at this time. Agreed. Viewers, as we move on, like Ron touched on earlier, the British Virgin Islands now has a total of 13 active COVID-19 cases, of which three of them are symptomatic with no recent travel history. This was revealed by the Minister of Health Honorable Carvin Malone in an impromptu press conference that was held earlier today. Listen in. As of yesterday, 28 June 2021, a total of 556,092 tests were conducted on individuals swabbed throughout the territory and assessed at the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital. The Virgin Islands now records a total of 313 cases with 299 recoveries and one death. There are presently 13 active positive cases in the territory, three of which were presented with symptoms and had no travel history. Active contact tracings of these cases continue and a number of primary contacts have been quarantined and scheduled for testing at the appropriate time. Now, here is Honorable Carvin Malone also mentioned that contact tracing efforts are ongoing according uh, to what the health experts are saying. Listen in. Currently also actively looking for any other persons who may have come into contact with these positive cases. All persons who have attended the following events are therefore asked to contact the department at 468 4936 to provide their names for contact tracing and testing for COVID-19. The locations and times of interest are June 20th, Club Aqua, between the hours of 8 and 10 p.m. June 20th, Club Crystals, 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. June 20th, Deuces, 11 p.m. until 
June 18th, Island Sizzle. Persons who have attended these locations at the specified times are asked to self-isolate. A further two to three local cases. A very uh, interesting twist of events, Ron. Yes. We, we went from having a relatively low number of cases to now 13. Um, also, very indicative of it being community, a community spread or community transmission, um, as uh, three of these cases had, uh, most of these cases, based on what I'm seeing, the, no, the symptomatic cases, no travel history, um, which means, yes, we are not out of the woods as yet, as, as Honorable Carver Malone said, yes. says, and we really need to continue to follow the protocols that are in place. Indeed. Viewers still ahead. The 2020 Miss BVI contestants are to be revealed this Friday. And, of course, we have a lot more in store for you. Stay tuned. You're watching 284 News. Is business slow? Cash flow down? Hosting an upcoming event? We can help. Advertise with 284 Media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies. Allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest. This could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284media at cctbvi.com. Advertising with us works. Viewers, welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Continuing on on the local scene, after a one-year hiatus, the territory's most prestigious pageant, Miss British Virgin Islands, returns to the stage on August 1st. Now, newly appointed chair of the Miss British Virgin Islands subcommittee, Miss Natalie O'Hodge, said the plans are underway for a spectacular evening featuring the talents of Virgin Islanders on one stage. She said, and I quote, Despite the challenges presented by the pandemic, the committee and contestants are curating an evening of elegance under the theme, a cultural identity, perseverance, resilience, evolution, Hodge said. Now, Hodge continued by saying, I know that the community is looking forward to seeing the next cohort of young women grace the stage with beauty, intellect, and pose. Uh, poise, that is, she said, uh, the queens, the next queen, will be an ambassador for the Virgin Islands and will be positioned to lend her voice to her platform and the challenges we are facing as a nation. Now, viewers, in this year's pageant, the contestants will compete in seven segments. They are Introduction, Cultural Dress, Swim Mirror, Cell BVI, Evening Wear, Question and Answer, and Personal Interview. The pageant's winner will receive a variety of prizes, including a $25,000 academic grant and travel opportunities. Meanwhile, the chairperson also announced that an undisclosed number of young women would be presented to the public as contestants vying for the prestigious title of Miss British Virgin Islands. She said, and I quote, to officially kick off the Miss BVI pageant, we are creating an island affair experience for the reveal event, whereby persons will have the opportunity to meet and mingle with young women while Enjoying local entertainment, the contestants will be officially revealed to the general public on Friday, July 2nd, that's this Friday at 6 p.m. at the Luxury Deck at the Cyril B. Romney Tortola Pier Park. The event will be hosted, of course, by Miss BVI 2019, Bria A. Smith and Kareem Nelson Hull. The evening will feature entertainment by a local performance and musical artist. There will be a $10 entrance fee, and of course, the pageant is part of the 67th Emancipation Celebration, sponsored, of course, by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, the government, of course, of the Virgin Islands, and coordinated by the Virgin Islands Festival and Fairs Committee. Now, the reigning Miss British Virgin Islands, Miss Brie A. Smith, is the only title holder to date to serve at two consecutive years. The Miss British Virgin Islands pageant is one of the longest-running pageants within the region. Uh, Jovan, I know you uh, are excited about this. Yes. Um, Jovan and I viewers have a little tag of war when it comes to pageants. And I've yeah. been trying to yeah. get him on yeah. the bandwagon. Yeah. He, he, he's not a huge fan, but he's coming along nicely. But I think it's always a prestigious opportunity to be able to represent your country and be an ambassador. Clearly, we've seen a BVI ambassador is doing extremely well yes. just recently copying uh, the first international title. And I think it's really testament to the quality of uh, women in the territory. And I'm really looking forward to see. Uh, I think I may have a and, hint or two and, 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 and of who's of, on the lineup, but I'm of looking forward to the talent, reveal. Uh, their talent, their talent, their intellect. And it's uh, pageants, I think, um, if, I, if I may say this, have long been about beauty and poise, but it's really about... Um, um, uh, 
no longer. Self awareness, no longer. Um, realization, and we're happy to see, in especially in these difficult times, I think the uh, general public of the British Virgin Islands is happy to see uh, women, young women, come forward and present themselves. Uh, present themselves and have fun and, and present to us an emancipation celebration. And of course, with that, it cannot go unnoticed without a Miss BVI pageant. Absolutely. BVI, so Miss BVI. And of course, the ladies. Yes, yes, yes. And also, I think some indication that we are going to be having a BVI Festival 2021. Led, so, led by us, the both of us. Fingers coming down the crossed. Road. Fingers crossed. But viewers, we have to move on. Now, the recent statement made by the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Julian Willock, which alleges that the former Commissioner of Police, Mr. Michael Matthews, hired criminals from across the region to assist the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force following the 2017 hurricanes, has been labeled as false and damaging. Former Commissioner Matthews responded to the claims made in Willock's position statement, which was submitted to the COI just recently. Paragraph 20 of Willock's statement read, and I quote, Immediately after Hurricanes Irma and Maria, the Commission of Police hired a number of foreign nationals as police officers without doing the appropriate background checks whatsoever. In fact, it is extremely likely that he would have hired persons that were well known as criminals elsewhere in the region. Now, viewers, Mr. Matthews said that the paragraph was brought to his attention and felt it was best to pen a letter to the Commission of inquiry Sir Gary Hickenbottom to present an accurate understanding to the COI of what exactly occurred. He said in his statement, and I quote, this is false, inaccurate, and in my view, defamatory towards myself as the former police of commissioner at that relevant time highlighted. To my knowledge, the Honorable Speaker was not part of the government of the BVI at that time, nor present in any meetings where security questions were agreed including the decision to seek assistance from external police forces. The statement made by the Honorable Speaker is pure fabrication and certainly is clearly not based upon any knowledge of the subject that he seeks to use as an example. His baseless allegations are an affront to all of the hardworking officers that supported the BVI at a time of exceptional need, he continued, end of quote, fears. Now, Matthews assured Sir Hickenbottom that all the appropriate measures were taken following the devastation that caused uh, that was caused to the territory by the hurricanes, which resulted in only 40 percent of the force being active. He further said, and I quote once again, with operational responsibility for security at that time, I immediately recommended to the governor, Mr. Gus Jasper, that we invoke mutual aid procedures from the United Kingdom to urgently increase policing resources within the territory. This was discussed and agreed with the then Premier, Dr. D. Orlando Smith, and the BVI government ministers available at that time. An approach was made to the UK Home Office via the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, an agreement reached with the National Police Chiefs Council to provide unarmed, ununiformed officers to the territory to supplement the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. All, con all UK officers, sorry, are vetted on appointment to their relevant UK force, and every officer deployed was selected by the chief constable in charge of the force that they were seconded from, Matthews further explained. Now, viewers, the former top cop also said that similar measures were taken to acquire armed police officers who had to be obtained from other UK overseas territories. He said, and I quote, using the existing mutual and mutual aid memorandum of understanding, the MOU agreed with the other UK territories police commissioners. I was able to source highly trained firearms response officers from the Bermuda Police Force and the Royal Cayman Islands Police Force. I am aware that both Bermuda and the Cayman Forces have vetting procedures in place as part of their normal recruitment policies as well as the additional vetting requirements for firearm officers. Matthews also added that it would have been reckless and irresponsible if he would have attempted to supplement policing and security in the BVI with anyone else other than existing experienced officers from affiliate, uh, affiliated jurisdictions. He said all due diligence was undertaken. Uh, but viewers, just recently, the new commissioner, uh, top cop, that is Mr. Mark Collins, he actually criticized the current vetting process and added that he is very concerned about the existing vetting system within the force. He said that he will be pushing to have the force hire a vetting officer who will then be tasked with ensuring suitable persons are enrolled within the organization. 
Mr. Collins said, and I quote, I don't think we vet and do enough background checks on officers transferring into the organizations or recruits. And one of the things I have put in my position statement is the desire to recruit a recruitment officer or vetting officer so that we can be very clear about who we are recruiting and making sure that they are suitable individuals to be serving as a police officer. The commissioner believes that the new special position, along with his improved professional standards, will help to fast track internal investigations to rid the police force of untrusty, I'm sorry, untrustworthy police officers, he said, and I quote once again, it would deal with things more robustly and in a timely fashion, because depending on the allegation I get against someone, I would want to do a severity uh, assessment and look at the suspending, I'm sorry, look at suspending that individual, taking them out of frontline duties. Ron, very interesting comments coming from both former commissioner, uh, Mr. Michael Matthews, the Speaker of the House of yes. Assembly, damning allegations, and then we also see uh, similar comments coming from the, for, uh, the current sorry, uh, Police Commissioner, Mr. Mark Collins, really supporting the fact that we need to have a more thorough vetting process uh, as we seek to recruit police officers. Well, Jovan, like we've said in our newscast, just like we uh, look to find skilled civil servants, we uh, look to find skilled teachers, and persons within the healthcare professions, I think health uh, law enforcement is exactly the same. And like uh, the new police commissioner, I don't think uh, we have been doing uh, that uh, keen of a job in mm -hmm. making sure that we're uh, finding precise persons. But now is of any good time to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, viewers, uh, after this commercial break, it's Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and we are joined by Dr. June Samuel, who's going to uh, touch on some very pivotal moments. We'll be yes. right back after we're from our sponsors. So you're saying I can ask this cat any question? The cat is connected to the computer. You just type in the question, it will read his mind. There's the answer code. You're the man! I've been looking for this for weeks. Viewers, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. Joining us uh, this evening is Dr. June Samuel. Dr. June Samuel, welcome back to 284 Media. Thank you so much for your time. So we are at the culmination of Alzheimer's Awareness Month, um, and it is still a very important uh, issue, an important topic as it pertains to the awareness, prevention, coping mechanisms, what it is we need to do exactly to make sure that persons in our community who are suffer from, suffering uh, sorry, from Alzheimer's Awareness are kept up to date. Uh, I want to begin by uh, you speaking about some of the uh, really attributing factors to Alzheimer's. I know there are new studies. What have we been seeing recently? So thank you, Ron. So June is usually celebrated as um, Brain Health Awareness Month. And the Alzheimer's Association uses the opportunity to um, bring to the public's attention um, the factors that we, the behaviors or other factors uh, that contribute to uh, overall brain health. And so one of the things that has, um, we've recently noted, the Alzheimer's Disease International group out of the UK, um, there was a study recently um, commissioned by the Lancet Commission. And what they've done is uh, come up with the what we call modifiable risk factors okay. as it relates to dementia. And uh, you know, for dementia, you know, they're, they're preventable. There's some things you can prevent, um, some factors, so we call those modifiable risk factors, the things that lie within our control that we can um, adjust to decrease the risk of us developing dementia. Okay. So, well, I'm excited about it because, you know, Sometimes when we talk about dementia, persons feel as if it is um, inevitable in some instances. Mm. And so what this study tells us is, no, if you look at these 12 things from a public health perspective, you can actually decrease the risk of dementia That's within great. the population. So within the early life, um, education. So persons who um, achieve lower levels of education, um, there's an increased risk that you can develop wow. um, dementia at a later stage. And that really has to do with something we call cognitive reserve. 
So in other words, um, the more you challenge your brain, the more you learn, the more you seek to learn, the more curious you are, um, the more you preserve your brain health over the long term. And it is one of the reasons that we advise persons, even as we get older, to always stay in situations where you are learning something new, uh, learning a new instrument, learning a new language. Uh, because by doing that, what you do is you challenge the brain to continuously develop that new Understood. circuitry and decrease your, um, your overall risk, right? In the midlife, um, we have a number of factors that we hear about here in the BVI all the time. So high blood pressure, yes. diabetes, obesity. Those have now been identified in this study as um, persons with those conditions, you, you run an increased risk of developing dementia at a later stage. Um, and, and it really has to do with um, all of the changes that happens in your body once you have those chronic diseases. Of course. Right? So, and the other things within the midlife um, age group, you know, things like excessive alcohol intake. Um, <laughs> some persons may not be too happy to hear about this. I'm sure. But more and more, excessive alcohol intake um, is being linked to so many things. We know it's linked to cancers. We know it's linked to... Um, liver disease, and now it is now coming up as a link with um, dementia. Of course, with that, Dr. Samuel, I must uh, culturally bring to relevance uh, the aspect of not wearing helmets. Um, that's something that we don't like to talk about as well, but we have a lot of uh, young men, young women too, who drive around and don't refuse, really refuse to wear helmets. That, if I'm correct, is that also not an attributing factor yes. uh, to the accident aspect of and brain damage. Mm -hmm. Right, it is. Um, so we have, you know, our younger middle-aged group of um, yeah. individuals who, you know, engage in probably, you know, probably excessive alcohol use. And then we have the traumatic brain injuries. So, um, and for us in the BVI, well, I always talk about this, the, the issue around scooters mm -hmm. and persons riding scooters without helmets. Um, and the link with, you know, if we get into accidents, brain injuries. And traumatic brain injury um, in young persons is linked with brain damage. It's, yes. it's, so therefore, you know, one of the things that you can end up with um, is something looking like a dementia. Um, and, you know, brain injury doesn't just come from scooters. I, you know, I talk about it because it's my pet peeve. But also, you know, if we're involved in sports um, where we can have head injuries, um, horseback riding, um, water sports, you know, any kinds of um, sports where you can have falls and, and basically, basically hit your head. Um, persons yes. riding, um, <laughs> driving without seat belts, so all those seat belts, legally we're supposed to be wearing seat belts. You know, more and more you look around, you see persons not wearing seat belts, you see children in vehicles not secured. So really that behavior from a cultural perspective increases the risk. Dr. Samuel, we are out of time, but I, I know this is a conversation that we cannot uh, all encompass in just one newscast, and we're going to have to uh, have you back. But I want to touch on just closing resources. What resources are available within the community for persons who may be experiencing or have loved ones uh, who are suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia? So for, for persons who may be caregiving or yes. um, providing care with the families or having persons hired, so we have support, we have a support group. This is the Alzheimer's Association uh, where we provide um, persons an opportunity to be able to talk about the challenges that they may face. Um, we also have more resources available for assessment and early intervention so that we can provide advice um, because we know that if someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it's basically a long road yes. um, and there are many challenges. Um, through social development, we try to arrange for support in terms of care. And of course, we, you know, there are lots of challenges in that area. Um, and one of the things that the association is, is going to be bringing on board um, before the end of this year, we're going to be offering some training, which Wonderful. is certified training for caregivers, um, because there has been such an increased demand in that area, because it is a specialized area in terms yes. of caring for individuals who uh, may be living with dementia. 
Well, Dr. Samuel, we're going to have you back, but we're out of time. Uh, viewers, uh, preventable uh, measures, early detection, and of course, coping mechanisms, they're all important. Jovan, uh, we are going to continue this conversation. Absolutely. But viewers, as Ron mentioned, all the time we have, I want to thank you so much for making time to sit with us. My name is Jovan Wilson. And I'm Ron Grant. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.